You are listening to the Animals at Home podcast, the podcast that inspires others to push the limits of their animal husbandry by promoting the importance of high-level, creative care, individualized for each animal. Welcome to episode number 58 of the Animals at Home podcast. If you're new here, my name is Dylan Parent. Thank you very much for joining me today. I hope you all had a chance to listen to last week's episode, which was Bryce Broom's first episode. If you were unaware, Animals at Home podcast, I've now transitioned to the Animals at Home network. It's always been one of my goals to create a more to, to create a podcast that had more diverse content and kind of branch out into different areas. And this is a project that Bryce and I had been working on for a while. So now he has his own show underneath the Animals at Home Network called Animals Everywhere. And last week he talked about breeding West African dwarf crocodiles with Israel Spruch. It was a fascinating episode. Izzy goes into this incredible detail about sort of replicating their natural environmental conditions to get these animals to breed. The West African dwarf crocodile is an incredibly difficult species to breed in captivity. So again, that just sort of highlights the importance of using nature and trying to replicate that as best we can in captivity. If you are looking for more information about the podcast, you can head to animalsathomenetwork.com. You can find links to both my show, Animals at Home, as well as Bryce's show, Animals Everywhere. Show notes for both shows are on there. You can find information about the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy, which is the charity that the network supports. And of course, you can also buy a shirt under the Animals at Home header if you want to buy a shirt or a t-shirt. $5 automatically gets donated to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy. And if you do want to reach out to me, my email address is there, or you can send me a DM on Instagram at Animals at Home CA. And before we jump into today's episode, let me thank our sponsor, CustomReptileHabitats.com. There are links in the show notes as well as the YouTube description. They are affiliate links, so if you do click on them and purchase something, a small commission does come back to me at no extra cost to you, and of course, that helps support the show. Custom Reptile Habitats puts our animals first. They never compromise quality over profits. And honestly, the products that they have on their website are the gold standard in the reptile industry. Arcadia, Universal Rock, Miss King Systems, Maximum Reptile Enclosures. They really do have everything. So if you are in the need of upgrading some equipment or you are about to buy a new animal, definitely go check them out. They probably have something you need. All right, let's jump into today's episode. I am very excited to share this with you. I recorded an episode about one year ago with this guest, and honestly, as I say early on in this episode, it was probably one of the more influential episodes I've done. If not, I think it was the most influential episode, and I say why early on in the podcast, and I I had many people that were asking about this and sent me lots of messages about it, and I am very happy and excited to say we have round two in this episode today. Today, I'm speaking with John Courtney Smith, who is the head of science and innovation at Arcadia Reptile. I know many of you are very familiar with John, and if you are not, you are in for a great treat. John is a wealth of information. He has written an incredible series of books that you can find at ArcadiaReptile.com. I'll post everything in the show notes afterwards. Everything will be there. But John is really an influential person inside the reptile trade. And not only is he this incredible trailblazer that has blasted through some of these old-time reptile myths, and he continues to do that, he's also incredibly accessible. He's constantly online giving people advice and and doing all the work on his own. He does this incredible amount of research. He's this, as I said, a, a, a sort of never-ending wealth of information, and he's continuing to ask questions. So he definitely did not disappoint in this episode, and I'm very excited to share this with you. On today's episode, we discuss the three parameters of overall nutrition, including heating, lighting, what the animals are ingesting. We focused on the moisture cycle and humidity cycle, but our main focus in this conversation was physical and mental enrichment and how to set up your enclosure properly, understanding the role that these animals play in the environment and the role they play in their society, and we go into more detail along with that as well. I don't want to talk too much. Let's just let John take it away. Enjoy the episode, and I will talk to you afterwards. Awesome. Well, John, welcome back to the show. Thank you very much for joining me again. Excellent to be here. This is the 57th episode I've recorded, and I think the most influential episode up to date has been the one that we did last year, which was episode number 24. Of course, I've had many great people on the show with amazing conversations, but that episode, more than any other, I received the most messages from people who, it's almost like outside of the echo chamber. Of course, I receive lots of messages from people who totally agree with what you're saying and they just say, hey, thanks for a great episode. But I also heard lots of people who were more industrialized who said, wow, that made me rethink the care and now I'm kind of drifting towards away from quantity to more quality, which was awesome. And I thought we could maybe use that quickly as a as a springboard to jump into just a, a topic that I've been tackling lately in my mind, which is sort of the psychology of the keeper. And it's, if I look at the hobby or the industry from a bird's eye view, I sort of see three rough groups. I see a group of people who are just 
who, who are interested in progressing. They're not necessarily advanced bioactive keepers, but they're always looking to improve their care. And then you have sort of the breeding side, which is your industrial more kind of profit people. And then there's a whole group of people who are in that sort of impulse purchase slash like birthday gift person who's just following their pet co care guide and they're not interacting with the hobby in any way like you wouldn't consider them a hobbyist it'd be the same as having like a goldfish in a bowl you wouldn't consider that person a, a person in the aquarium hobby are those people accessible do you think that they're accessible to improve care or they just do you sort of see them as more like collateral damage with the industry because a lot of times they're poor care yeah, I, I absolutely don't view them as there. You know, the, the the fact of the matter is that the majority of good reptile keepers or advancing reptile keepers, we're all advancing constantly, but the majority of entry-level keepers were those that started off with a garter snake, leopard gecko, a hermit crab, mm -hmm. and they just had this little... I don't condone impulse purchasing at all. In actual fact, all of my material, and particularly in the trade-focused material that we publish in the UK to help the trade, you know, we constantly suggest, look, you should sell an enclosure one day and then at least give 24 hours before the animal goes in. You know, that should be the minimum. Ideally, let's leave that with a week to be properly fitted out and stabilise any electrical issues come, come to the fore. Um, but the majority of us started with that one small animal and have progressed and progressed and progressed. And it's up to keepers like you and I to inspire them onto, on, onto being better keepers. And, and in turn, they will inspire us by asking questions. Well, you know, I, I moderate on a few of the Facebook groups now. I don't have a, time, a lot of time to do much at all, but I, I try and keep an eye. The amount of new keepers that join these groups or apply to join these groups every day is shocking it's thousands sometimes and each one of those even if they don't um, verbally interact with the group they're at least seeing one or two posts and as long as those posts matter we can inspire you know we uh, we shared an image on our instagram uh, feed this over this weekend of, of when we're recording previous of a, of a chap who who had been a, a basic keeper read some of our advice read some of our published work listened to a few different U, um, youtube channels and and has built this most incredible open topped large leopard gecko enclosure where the, the, the animals protected it's safe it's really well heated really well illuminated and i just look at that and think you know, and I noticed that some of the world's most famous reptile keepers have not only liked that picture, but they've commented as how nice it is as well. But, you know, for, for me, it's that inspiration. That chap w will have started with basic care as an entry-level keeper and then been inspired and inspired and inspired because advice is free now. Right. And, and now it's built this. I've never seen an open topped leopard gecko enclosure in my life. I, I've not seen one. I've seen some big ones, but they've always been enclosed. And I think because this one is guaranteed to be safe, it's built in a way where the animal can't get out. There's no cat predation. It's well in an insulated room and provided for correctly. He's designed it just expertly. Now, in 10 years' time, we might look back and go, oh, well, we would have done this and we would have done that. But now, do you know how proud that makes me? To, to be able to see that entry level come in and just do really, really well. Then whether they, whether the entry decides to go down the fork of um, sort of naturalistic keeping and doing the best they can for the animal or fully blown bioactive or whatever they decide to do, that, that's, that's entirely up to them. But as long as we're all advancing, so, so my only word, and to answer your question um, in a single sentence, is it's up to us as keepers. Okay, I represent a, a particular theory within a brand and have a voice for that. But my voice is tiny compared to the combined voice of all the keepers in the world. If we are willingly and helpfully and, more importantly, politely sharing our information, everybody has a good chance of doing it better and then becoming better keepers and ending up with two or three animals that they've done really well. Yes, no, that is so true. And it, 
the Facebook groups can be really rough on those newbies. They come in and they have, you know, their reptile carpet and a weird hide and they don't really know. And they're just asking questions. And a lot of times they get, they can get ripped apart. And it is important to remember most of us started that way and it's how you have to start. And the great thing about reptiles is they do have a little bit of a window where you can kind of mess around with your care a little bit. If you're not perfect off the bat, it's totally fine. You can grow with them. Yeah, yeah. Some species are quite forgiving. I had a little nightmare earlier in the week where someone on a bearded dragon group had uh, got confused or something had happened and it ended up with a a gama a gama. And and you just see an animal there that, you know, has been imported for decades and they just don't do well. And you you immediately go, whoa, whoa, that's not a bearded dragon and please don't try and keep it like one or you're going to be really upset and the animal is going to really not do very well. Not in three months' time, but maybe in two or three days because that's how quick they start to go downhill. Um, So there's the the, the odd thing where you think, oh, must just jump in and say something there. But, for, yeah, this, I, I find it embarrassing with the way that some people talk to other humans yes. online. Yeah, and, I always say uh, you would never do that if it was face-to-face. No, no, you'd get a punch it, up the throat. <laughs> exactly. It would be such a crazy way to communicate. Like, hey, idiot, <laughs> yeah. let me start with telling you why you suck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Nobody does yeah. that. So I think if we, if we can all be helpful and polite to each other, and give good advice and, and share our own experiences, we, we, we will all learn anyway. Mm-hmm. And uh, things will just speed through. Do you know what? Reptile keeping community should be seen as a community, a family. Mm-hmm. And we'll have our ups and downs, but there's no need to talk to people in that ultra-aggressive way. We, we'll get a far better, you always, in whatever business, hobby, whatever cycle of your life, you'll always get a better reaction out of people if you're polite to them. Mm-hmm. Totally agree. And, <laughs> so so yeah as far what about the term animal welfare because this is a term that i use all the time and a, especially in the united states i feel like the it, it gets a lot of keepers upset when you invoke that term because they immediately gravitate towards PETA or something and how do you feel about that term i think it's a great term is there yeah. do you think that there's ways we can discuss animal welfare without making people think that we're some sort of PETA party well i think I think it's a term that I use all the time, Mm -hmm. advancing animal welfare and ethical care, advanced, advancing ethical animal welfare, all these things. And the the, the thing that makes people jump the most is that they liken the term animal welfare to animal rights. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I am a huge, passionate believer in the fact that animals have rights and that they are deserving of very good, very high standards of welfare. However, animal rights is the flip side to that coin, where we have obsessive people that, uh, on the main it would seem, are just anti-keeping animals and and don't see the importance of that human-animal interaction. And I have no problem whatsoever with anybody who has the skills, time, and money to be able to care for an animal. I don't have the problem at all with that. As long as somebody has the skills, time, money, space to care for an animal and they're willing to do so, that human-animal bond is so important that I think everybody should be able to be able to do that, whether that's with a hamster or a stick insect or a dog or whatever you choose. As long as you can care for it, you should have access to it. But it's that likening between animal welfare and animal rights that, that, that um, get people riled up. And, you know, I've been accused even myself of being animal rights. Could, could, I can't believe that. But I, I passionately believe that animals have rights and that you can agree with that without having the um, aggressive outlook of core animal rights so it's a term that i have decided to continue to use because eventually through desensitization people will start to understand that that expression and use it properly animal welfare is vital and if we can't prove that we can expand on animal welfare constantly day on day we may lose our right to have that human animal interaction and through legislation but who can afford to have that 
I totally agree. And, and that's the point that I always try to make that it, it is our responsibility. And even if you're, you don't like the term, I mean, it, it, animal welfare, it, there's no better way to describe exactly what we mean by saying those two words, animal welfare. And, and a lot of times people do think that you're going to infringe on their rights, but legislation will, I mean, in the UK, you guys experience this a lot, right? And the same with in Canada, there's legislation all over the place. And I think some keepers think that those are never going to affect them. They're never going to have the government come and say, hey, you can't keep these animals anymore. But it does happen. And if, if we let the animal, the actual animal rights groups get a hold of too much, then that's what will happen. Across the board. Mm -hmm. Across the board. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So let's jump into the three parameters of overall nutrition that, that you've talked about. And I, want to, I want to talk about mostly the third one, but we'll kind of give a little review of, of, of all of them. So maybe you could just kind of lay them out really quick, and then we'll, I have some questions uh, for each thing. Okay, so very quickly, the three, the three parameters, what I described of as the three parameters of overall nutrition was an extension to the theory of wild recreation. So we published the original theory of wild recreation in the third book and how, how I really um, had this epiphany that we could really start to care for our animals uh, more ethically and effectively through trying as closely as we could to replicate the natural environment. And, of course, a couple of years went past and I'm constantly trying to ref ref re um, refine the different uh, aspects of the theory and that led into um, what we called in the fourth book the three parameters of overall nutrition so I tried to quantify what nutrition was because nutrition is such a, an overarching term that, that doesn't just involve what goes in the mouth so uh, the first parameter of overall nutrition is everything every source of energy or building block of life, so mineral, amino acid, fat, fiber, um, everything that is, um, sorry, the first parameter is everything that surrounds the animal, the energy that surrounds the animal. So, so that's the energy that's within light predominantly, but also oxygen to, to, or, or, or air to, uh, to an extent as well. So the energy that's contained within photons of light I view as being as much part of the nutritional cycles and of having as much importance to the nutritional cycles for all species, not just reptiles, as that which goes in the mouth. So the first parameter of overall nutrition is the energy that surrounds. The second parameter is the energy that is ingested or the building blocks of life. So everything that is eaten, um, drinking, um, to an extent, even um, air again, but, but moisture from the air as it's going over the tongue, it still contains broad spectrum minerals, so that's still nutrition. So we have um, everything that is ingested. So um, for, for warm-blooded animals, we've got energy from food and for, for exotherms, we, we obviously have energy plus the building blocks of life. And then the third parameter of overall nutrition, overall nutrition is the importance of mental and physical enrichment. Now, that immediately started to upset a few people when I published that because they can't uh, – how can movement and stimulation of the brain be part of a nutritional cycle? Well, if you're unfit, if your muscles aren't toned, if you're – vital organs are not moving around, if your blood is not pumping fast enough and circulating, if you're not um, going through the excretory processes properly, um, you are unhealthy and your body cannot make full use of the energy that you have ingested or been exposed to. The wrong stimulation of the mind, so uh, the introduction of a predator or disease or um, any form of fear, that kind of fight or flight response would cause a spike, cortisol spike in the body, which then impacts the immune system, which then reduces the amount uh, of assimilation, storage and use that can go on. And we have a direct impact of both mental and physical stimulation or enrichment um, impacting the entire nutritional cycles within exposure to light and everything that we eat and drink. So, so th those were the three parameters of overall nutrition as they first 
were laid out in fire. Okay, yeah, that's awesome. So I'll, I'll, I want to just, we'll start with the first one, which surrounds the body of, of, of the reptile. And I don't want to go into too much detail because we've talked about UV and light a lot, but there's a few things that I find really interesting. And I think it's always important to touch on this topic. But Liam, who is the, the creator of the Reptiles and Research YouTube channel, which is a fairly new YouTube channel, recently yeah, yeah. did a video where he was responding to a comment that Kevin McCurley left him, basically accusing him of, you know, all animals... Liam's point is all animals should require, especially all reptiles, require UV, and Kevin disagreed. So Liam went kind of through the, in a, in a really sort of brilliant way, broke it down of going through some studies and why Kevin was wrong. And you commented on that video, and I found it interesting. Part, partly you said you actually found yourself emotional watching the video, so I wanted to take that apart yeah. just a little bit with you, because I don't think people understand how much of a trailblazer you are in the UV movement. And maybe you could start with just briefly those early days when you were finding UV, what led you down that path and, and what sort of criticism were you facing when you first started bringing UV into the hobby? Well, the, the criticism that, that Liam experienced from a guy actually that I respect, mm -hmm. I must say, you know, um, by both of them I respect and, and both of them have their own sides of the fence and I know which side of the fence I'm on. But that that criticism that he faced there was absolutely nothing like the criticism that I faced when I first published uh, a magazine article saying, "Well, hey, leopard geckos aren't really nocturnal, so we should we should probably be." You know, not only are they not nocturnal, but the biggest problem in captivity is MBD. So there's a problem here. Uh, I think we should probably start using UV lights. You know, I said in the la in the last episode that we recorded together, I received threats you know credible threats against myself and my family for, for publishing that from the core trade and um you know i i've had periods of time in my career and in my hobby where you just think do you know what? i can't do this anymore you know i i've banged this drum for so long and we're not getting anywhere and i still get sent these pictures of animals with broken limbs coming out of the eggs and i still see this and i still get crying people phone me up saying they've bought their animal and now it's being euthanized you know we, we still get well not so much now but i still was then when i when you have these sort of mini meltdowns but actually to watch that video and uh, have having watched the video prior to that and seeing the reaction and the way that Liam had pulled everything apart and he had used good scientific research and really good forward thinking um, theory to present an argument. I just, it was one of the very first times where I actually sat, sat in front of the computer and saw they get it. So, so I, I actually just had a, had a few moments and thought, you know what, there's, there's people out there that, that are starting to really think the way that, a number of us have been thinking for a long period of time. Now, it's not just me. I just have a mouthpiece, you know. And uh, so uh, that, that's why I found it emotional. I suddenly thought, goodness, we've actually achieved something. We've, the, 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 the hot, and, and when you started to look at the comments and some of the Facebook comments that went on around that, you know, 98% of it was positive mm -hmm. and, and everybody saying, look, no, no, the guy's wrong. We, we, we must be doing better by our animals. We've got to be doing better by our animals. And, and, and the proof is always in the pudding. If you install a system of care that is effective and ethical and measured, you will see a positive difference in your animal. And I have never spoken to a keeper ever, not ever, out of the hundreds of thousands of lamps that we sell, that has ever come back to me and said, I put a UV lamp on there and my animal doesn't look as good as it used to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Ever. It's, it's, it's amazing. And it is, it is really, it's because this is a long journey for you. And then for now it to be part of the reptile industry sort of meme that this, we, 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 a lot of us do accept UV as important. And so it was really cool to see that as a comment. It's almost like you've, you've finally overcome that you and, and everybody else that's been kind of touting that for so long, but it, it's not, it wasn't an easy path and it wasn't a short path either, which is no, no, we're, talk, over, we're talking over 10 years. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's I can, ob obviously you can see where the emotion comes from because it's uh, that, that's a hard, a hard job to do. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I was delighted. And, and, and even more so, you know, we don't all have to agree and we shouldn't always all agree and nobody has all the right answers or would be a dictatorship as long as we're having conversation and that conversation is polite 
and constructive, then we will forge a, a pathway ahead yeah. for sure. No, I totally agree. That, that so that was very cool. So, and the, the last point I want to make on this this one is the increase of visible light increasing the welfare of the animal. And I, I last year I bought the LED jungle uh, the, the jungle dawn LED bar, which you know. And at first I was just completely blown away and scared almost at how bright this thing was. Like I turned it on in my living room and I'm like, no, this is just too much. Like I can't, it was like illuminating the whole room and I couldn't believe that a light could be that bright. And now I'm totally used to it. I can't imagine not having it. But I, I just wanted to touch on, because I think for some people it would be mystifying that if you add more visible light to an enclosure, you're actually going to be adding energy into the animal. Maybe you could quickly touch on that. Yes, well, the overall overarching point that we must make here all light is energy mm -hmm. because all light is photons and photons are energy they just carry a different color or wavelength or quantity of energy and impact the body in a different way and you know the, the work most of the work that i've been doing since about october last year um, and, and obviously going on, and it's going to go on for a long period of time yet, is actually trying to quantify the importance of visible light, what it actually does, and, and providing quantities of visible light. You know, we know, and we've known for a long period of time, that the lamps that we use in, in reptile care are a fraction of the brightness of natural daylight. A fraction. Yeah. And... Um, even though we have our heat, quantity of heat sorted out, and we're starting to sort out the spectrum of infrared as well. And, of course, we can now really accurately provide a, an accurate UV index. We're kind of getting really good at heat and UV and just starting to tickle the surface of the importance of visible light. And, and what that full spectrum between blue and red um, in the correct quantity actually does to life. Now, you, you, you know, there's millions of studies in all forms of animal care and human medicine that shows an increase in visible light is good for your brain. Otherwise, we wouldn't have things like sad lamps, you know, seasonal affective disorder, which is actually mostly to do with a vitamin D3 crash. But there is a, there is a, uh, a definite link towards lax quantity of light how much light is coming in through the eyes and, and 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 in reptiles we can actually say through the bone of the head um the the activation of the pineal gland um and uh, i just love the expressive term that francis baines used and continues to use over the years is that yes we must light up their brains mm -hmm. and um and you know what I really think there's a, an importance there. So one of the reasons that we worked for so long on this Jungle Dawn bar was to be able to create a, a diode that was full stretch, spectrum between blue and red without using separate blue and red diodes, but that would be able to force plant growth. You know, if, the, the main problem that reptile keepers have is that their live plants die off, and they die off because they're not being exposed to energy. PAR, photosynthetic active radiation. And if we look at photosynthetic active radiation, we are looking at the energy contained within the full spectrum of visible daylight. Now, if that energy is available and usable to a plant and omitting it from our vivaria causes those plants to die off through lack of energy, that energy all must then according to the theories of natural selection or development over time, however you want to describe it, must have an important interaction with all life. Mm. Yeah, no, I because totally agree. it is energy mm -hmm. and all energy is wasted, is used. None is wasted. Otherwise, we wouldn't have natural selection. So, so there is this importance of quantity of light which we can see through stimulating the eyes, stimulating the brain, stimulating the pineal gland for species that, that, that have that third eye, plus all the research that shows how important an increase of lux is, plus the fact that we know that our terraria is too dim, plus the fact that we know, because all light is made of photons and all photons are energy, that there is energy there to be used, therefore it must be used. 
So this creation of a lamp that allowed us to really, really effectively grow plants suddenly started to see welfare ch- and behaviour changes in animals as well. Typically, um, in, in, in animals that showed good coloration, they started to display higher levels of, levels of coloration. And we started to see really a lot, and not just in my collection, but a lot of feedback coming in from around the world where people saying, hey, I've just put your jungle dawn on. We've had it running a couple of weeks. And my chameleon's choosing to bask under the LED and not the, not the heat lamp. You know, what do you know about that? Mm-hmm. Well, firstly, I knew nothing and I couldn't <laughs> understand it. You know, I was like, goodness, this doesn't, they're, they're obviously seeking out a bright light source, but why would they do that um, whilst emitting, being exposed to the correct wavelengths of infrared, which keeps them going? Well, there's energy there and it is impacting the body in some way. So we're kind of at the level now, and I have to be really honest, you know, there's a lot of people studying visible light and its importance. But for me, I really do feel um, at the stage with my research into visible light that I felt with 10 years ago when we first started talking about leopard geckos and UV. I think we're just starting to really scrape the surface. You know, you say the product's bright, and it's bright. Um, and it's a nice flood. There's no dark spots. It's a nice color. It works well. It's pleasing. We now understand it's full of energy. Um, what else can it do? Where, where will this lead us? You know, and, and should we be starting to look at the product in a way where well, actually this, well, our, our enclosures have been too dim? Well, what kind of period of the day does this product allow us to, to simulate? And actually, I, I did the research into that. If you look at the lux levels of the um, most popular size of, of bar, which is the 18 and the 22 inch, um, if you look at the lux levels of those, when being used in sort of typical average enclosures, they're actually now starting to produce levels of visible daylight that are akin to mid-morning in, of natural sunlight. So we're nowhere near the brightness of full midday sun. Wow. But actually, we're, we're, we're starting to get towards mid-morning, whereas we were, actually, in terms of lux, we were at somewhere like 5 o'clock in the morning or something, with, even with T5s. Wow. So, so, so they're bright. And they feel really bright to start off with, but they're certainly not as bright as what the animals experience in the wild. Therefore, we still have a long way to go. Right. And I know that for me, the first thing I noticed was the color. It's, it, I have it in a giant day gecko enclosure and the green that I had never seen the greenness. I don't know if it was just the way the, the light was making her scales look different or over time she became healthier with the light, but it was just like night and day difference is this incredibly lime green color and it was just fascinating to see and like you said it's bright when you first turn it on but you get used to it and now i can't imagine like i can't imagine how dim it would look without it yeah it's horrible when you turn them off and just have the t5s yeah. or if you've still got if you've still got any t8s lying around and you think goodness oh, i must turn that back on but to answer your question it's actually a little bit of both the the bright the the, the, the light is, is obviously bright, so it's enabling you to see. It's of a high color rendering index, so it's enabling you to see in the most natural way, so it being akin to the color of sunlight. Um, and we are finding an increase in the coloration of the animal, so it's not all of one. Um, the, the light is enabling you to see the animal in its most natural colors, but it also seems to be impacting the animal to provide those colors as well. Right. Yeah. Very fascinating. And the, the last thing I wanted to touch on light was, and I know your, what your answer is going to be here, but it, I think it's worth kind of exploring because I get this question a lot. You Supplying UV for fossorial species. So that you, I have people, you know, with uh, sand boas or, or, you know, burrowing snakes that you don't see most of the day. And they always ask if they need to supply UV. So I assume the answer, or I know the answer is yes, but maybe you could quickly touch on that uh, with, with those species that spend a lot of time underground. Yeah, it, it is a difficult one because you would look at it and say, the animal's under the ground, how could it possibly use light? Well, they're not always under the ground. And, um, you know, we know the different adaptations in the skin and skin coloration. You know, they can, 
they can spend long periods of time deep underground and have no exposure. They can come over ground and have a bit of exposure, or they can come just particularly with sandboas just below this. And you've got to think the areas where the Kenyan sandboa is, okay, and, and even the um, like Russian sandboa and you know these ones which are more um, unlike rosy boas, which will obviously sit out and bask, uh, but the ones that are more fossil. Um, you know, they're, they're existing in environments that have colossally high UV indexes for many months of the year and long periods over the day. There is a vast amount of energy pouring down over them. They might only have to um, expose a very small part of the skin for a very short period of time just to top up what they need to. Um, so, I, you know, I, I keep... Um, legless, really quite fossil legless skinks as well, little tiny Egyptian things. And they spend most of their lives under the sand, the most boring pet you could ever have. <laughs> Fantastic as, a, as an enthusiast to see them getting on with their reproductive cycles. But every now and again, once or twice a month, they'll come out and sit on the rocks and bask for 20 minutes to an hour, and then they'll go back off again straight under the ground. Um, so I think the the... the the only advice that I've given in the past is, well, look, if you want to include UV, just like you feel that you need to include heat, because you can't have heat in the wild without having visible light and UV. It's mm -hmm. all the one homogeneous source. Um, well, then we put it in and we put it in in a safe and measured way and we leave it running all day long. And if they want to use it, they will. If they don't, they won't. At least you've done your best. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's the only advice that I can give. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, it's almost in an ironic sense, a Kenyan sandboa might need a higher powered UV to, to replicate what they're getting in those, you know, African deserts where it's just ridiculously yeah. hot. Yeah. Yeah. Even though for the majority of the time, they probably won't be using it. Right. Yeah. That's interesting. We can't second guess nature. That's the issue. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So let's jump to the second one, which is uh, in what they're ingesting. And I actually want to, we won't talk about food today because I want to make sure we, we cover everything we want to, but I'm really curious about humidity cycles and moisture. And I know that's, I think you kind of loop that into the, what the, the parameter of what they ingest. And I think this is a topic that in, in general, the trade doesn't really explore too much. We kind of just take your one humidity reading and, you know, somebody went out to the, the location and took a humidity reading in the middle of the day. And then they said, that's what this species needs to be kept at 70%. And we just go from there, but it is so much more complicated and almost exciting than that. So maybe we can just jump into it from there. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Humidity is one of the subjects that really baffles me. You know, we, we just don't know enough about the, um, levels of humidity and how these animals use it in the wild state per species. And then, as you say, you get arbitrary readings day and night, and they can help us as keepers. Oh, well, it needs to be 80% in the day and 40% at night. Really? That's really not how it happens. Humidity goes up at night as the earth cools. Ah, oh, right, okay. And, well, we don't need this crash between 40% or 60%. What we have to have is slow curves up and down and actually if we now, now that we know it, i mean particularly with peter Netches's work in, in chameleons you know that guy has opened my eyes in a way that i'd never really thought to the importance of the humidity cycles and how the earth can almost desiccate during the day and become a spar at night and and for these animals that 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 can uh, alongside um ingestion of food that can be almost their entire method of, of collecting water um, or topping up the water that they've collected during the day simply by breathing it in and it, it running, you know, I mean, there's lots of different reptiles and I've said it in all of my books where, they, where they'll use capillary action to draw collected moisture over the body into the mouth. And uh, so I think... I'm really starting to get a little bit jumpy when I start seeing people posting about, oh, well, this chameleon should have this um, percentage of humidity and this bearded dragon should have this percentage of humidity. Well, why? Where are you measuring it? How are you measuring it? How accurate is that tool that you're using to measure it? And what's your cycle during the day? Because really what you should be doing is having a really deep substrate, three to 12 inches, really, 
this is this is what will regulate your humidity. You might think I'm crazy, but it's the earth that regulates our humidity. So really deep substrate, plant it, decorate it, do whatever you want. Use your heating during the day to uh, and lighting to provide for the needs of that animal as it would in the day, and the enclosure or the top layer of the enclosure will start to dry off just as it does in in, in nature. We just talk about bearded dragons. Think about bearded dragons for for the moment. Then actually, because we're in a closed environment and we don't have clouds or weather rollover or instant showers or anything like that, as you turn your heating off to drop down from your daytime to your nighttime temperature, you're better then to lightly spray your enclosure so that you maintain a below the surface level, high level of humidity, uh, not wetness, but humid in the soil. Um, and as the enclosure starts to cool down, hot air will rise and that will carry water with it and your humidity will rise just like it does in the wild and that animal will have an almost instant positive effect in its skin health and it will be breathing in moisture and all the minerals that moisture contains as well um, naturally. Now, we, we kind of have to be careful. We ha always have to think these are closed environments. How effective is our system you know is our bioactive system fully functioning or are we just allowing a humidity spike at night that is bacteria laden and we're going to end up with ri no so we need to keep in our minds these are closed loops we have to be the weather we have to be the sun we have to be the providers of food we have to maintain and alter that system to keep uh, a herpetological nirvana that, that, that's what we have to do. Now, that may mean that we install uh, powered fans to aid us or better ventilation systems to aid us circulate air and keep bacterial bloom um, and moulds low, but we will need to step in and we'll see a benefit of stepping in for allowing these humidity cycles from drying to um, becoming wet again through the days and then through the seasons. How are we going to do that? Just like we did all those years ago, starting to look at UV, we can use weather channels. We can use the reports of keepers that want to go to these environments for their holidays and report back. Well, actually, we found that, you know, it got really, really quite sticky during the late afternoon, actually, and it carried on getting wetter and wetter. But by the morning, it had dried. You know, these are the kind of information that can really help us. And, you know... Is this just advanced keeping or is there a use to this? You know, is this something that, that clever people want to tinker with because they've got the ability to now? Or is this going to show a, a welfare increase in your animal? Providing the correct quantity and quality of water to any species on Earth in the correct way, so the method of collecting that water that they have developed to use will definitely show a marked improvement of welfare against an animal that's dehydrated yeah yeah totally and or over desiccating <laughs> yeah you know one of the i think it's in your second book or your third book where you, where you talk about uh, you know water and moisture and, and hydration and everything and you actually mentioned that shedding is not really a low humidity problem it's a dehydration problem and every yeah. time people just say oh it's going to shed i'll just spray my snake down if you are having shedding problems it's not the fact that you didn't have humidity humidity is related to it but your snake is dehydrated you need to get more moisture into its body that, that's right so it's, it's, in most cases shedding issues are nutritional now when you start to think back to the three parameters of overall nutrition if you can get those right your shedding issues will go away because it's either a problem with energy going in, it's a core ingestible nutritional imbalance, or it is um, an external factor, humidity, or even as we get into the kind of expanding on the, the, the subject of enrichment, not having the correct type of um, decoration within the enclosure to allow the, the animal to slough properly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So everything can kind of pull back into those three parameters. As long as we can tick those off, 
then we know that we're doing our best at, at every opportunity. Exactly. Yeah. And I'm, I'm very excited to see where airflow, humidity and all those things are going to go because it's, it's very new in a lot of ways. And I've really only worked on it with one of my animals and, and uh, uh, Bill Strand's podcast has helped me out a lot with understanding how to spike humidity in the evening and, and make sure you yeah. have really good airflow. And it's bizarre to see like my day gecko really only drinks in the morning or in the evening. I don't see her drink a lot anymore where before I would miss in the day and she would just like go crazy to drink water and you realize, wow, she's actually dehydrated. These animals dehydrated. don't drink in the daytime in the, in the wild, really. Well, they don't need to. Mm -hmm. And why would they? It would just increase their risk of production. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. They wait till the night. Yeah. It's interesting. So let's jump into the third one because that's what one we really want yeah. to talk about. And uh, so, so this is mental and physical enrichment and you've kind of broken this into sort of five areas. Yeah. So maybe we can go through those. Yeah. So, so obviously in, in the book, we just sort of paraphrase and, and, and say these three parameters and what they might uh, look like. What I've tried to do recently in the past few weeks um, and there's a, a magazine, a series, well, a small series of magazine articles that will be coming out. First to the trade, it's important that the um, sellers of reptiles under, uh, have access to information so that they can help educate keepers. And then we'll release it into the um, keeper sphere as well. Um, but to try and expand upon the importance of um, mental and physical and core nutritional stimulation or enrichment. Um, and, I, and, and, and it can kind of start, sound a little bit hippified, oh, well, you know, what do I need to do to enrich my snake? It just sits there doing nothing all day anyway, you know. What's its brain going to do if I wiggle a feather at it? <laughs> it, it you know, and, 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 and I guess those are kind of valid questions, but actually if we start to look at it seriously, and, and what I've tried to do is break the – provision of mental and physical stimulation into five key areas that as keepers we can just think about how will my enclosure decorative the decorative style of my enclosure how can this have a positive or negative impact on my animal how, what, what will it do to help that animal provide for itself while I'm providing for it um, you know, we all know that bad mental health is just as bad for you as um, bad physical health or a bad diet, you know, because everything is interrelated within the three parameters. If one parameter falls apart or one section of a parameter falls apart, the rest of them do. So you end up with kind of cataclysmic health problems or restrictions from what you possibly could see from that animal. You know, go back to the conversation that, that Liam was having just very briefly. Okay, yes, you can keep a tokay gecko or a leopard gecko or a corn snake or a king snake or whatever you want to keep in a dark drawer with no UV light and no visible light and just a heat mat and it will survive and reproduce, just as we said the last time. But you're actually missing out on the privilege of providing for that animal properly and seeing that animal in its most natural form, behaving like the wild animal rather than sitting in a tub, and then benefiting from the uh, whatever percentage increase there is in genetic health as you go through reproduction or, you know, for, for big producers, even when you look at uh, poultry farming, how many, uh, how many more eggs over a longer period of time can, can the introduction of a certain thing uh, provide per broiler hen? You know, you're starting to look at increasing productivity. So what I tried to do is, uh, or what I've done for this magazine series, I'm just going to keep looking down at my notes here because it's, this is just, I've only really started finishing it this week. It's, it's all very new. So I've tried to kind of categorize it into five areas of, of what we call five layers of enrichment. Um, and the first layer would be nutritional supply. So the building blocks of life. This is how we're enriching an animal by feeding it in the way that it was designed to be fed. Okay. So chameleon keepers should be feeding flying animals. That is not only good for nutritional supply, but it's also good for other areas of stimulation that, that we'll look at as well. So you're, you're in, increasing the variety of the diet but also impacting the health of the body and the health of the mind by feeding in the correct way. 
you know, that, that goes back to the conversation we've just had about providing water correctly. You know, providing water in the right way is, is, is kind of layered in with the importance of, of, of providing nutritional supply uh, properly and how that relates to um, uh, our care and provision um, uh, over the animals. So we, we then have the, the kind of thinking about the place that that animal um, lives in, its, its place in society. It's place in the it's place in the ecosystem. What job does it have? What does it do? Um, you know, we, we can then start to use that information to adjust the decorative style of our of our bibs. Now, you look back at again. Let's just look at some of the bearded dragon keeper forums uh, or, or Facebook groups. In 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 the last kind of even three years, we've gone from it being really really common to have tiles or newspaper with a hide at one end, a heat lamp, a UV lamp, and maybe a bed or a chair or, <laughs> or a hammock or something like <laughs> yeah. that. So now people with deep substrates and all that dross has gone away and live grasses and um, uh, rock stacks, we're starting to think about how that animal functions in the wild. Now, what's its job of work? If we can think what its job is, if it's an insect eater and it lives along the floor, it is insect control that that's its job. It's keeping insect numbers down and uh, it's, you know, when you start to open it up, it therefore transfers its energy onto predators and so on and so forth. But if we can start thinking of what its job is, how it, co- how it collects food, we can start to use that to um, alter our enclosure design, which then leads on to the other points. And just to, to, to remain on that point for just one, one second, I think that concept of understanding the role they play in the ecosystem is something that almost across the board, the reptile trade or industry hasn't really explored. Like you, you can really think like scavengers, for example, like it's very easy to think of different scavengers in your brain, hyenas, ravens, all, you know, vultures and things like that. And that's the role these animals play in society. But when I think about a snake or a lizard in the wild, it does my, I'm kind of racking my brain to think about the roles that these play. Like, I think a lot of what you're saying is right with, you know, insect control or rodent control, things like that. But it would be great if the hobby could start thinking that way and coming up with answers to that question. Mm. Well, here's a good one for you. What about pollination? Yeah, that's huge. The, important, the importance of pollination. Reptiles are just as uh, important to pollination as birds and insects. And therefore that leads in, you know, thinking about its place in society, what, what's its job of work, if that animal, let's say, for example, that we've got um, a small uh, um, Lydolactylus or some, some kind of small gecko that is uh, a honeydew eater and living around flowering plants, helping with pollination, well then, okay, we need to be providing flowering plants for that animal to live in. Um, and, oh, shock horror, maybe we should be including more pollen in its diet because everything that it eats is going to be saturated in pollen because that's where the insects are that, and on and on. Can you, can you see what I'm trying to say? Yeah, okay, every animal's got a job and we should think about it. But actually, it's, it's deeper than that. How, does that. how does that animal interact in its microcosm? And what parts or even one part of that can we take to improve welfare? Exactly. And if you don't give them the opportunity to act out their job, that's where you start getting into stress and cortisol and all these different things. And that links back to nutrition. Like if, if you're, like we said before, if you don't have a healthy system, if you are stressed all the time, anybody that's been nervous for something, you know that it's going to upset your stomach and you're not going to digest your food. It's going to come out one way or the other and it's not going to be right. So th- that's, that's all relates. We have the same systems in that sense. So having a high stress level due to the fact that the animal can't act out its role relates to all of that yeah yeah exactly i agree so again the importance you provide it all and you provide it in balance Mm. or you have no balance yeah exactly and and we we end up back in the uh you know two foot fish tank with newspaper and a fly strip situation (laughs) you know we we don't ever want to go back there do we yeah exactly so the the other um layer that i that i included in there was its place in society now, this this was more when I was thinking because I, obviously I work. I, yes, my my job is ninety five percent reptiles, but I also work with zoo animals and uh, birds and, and all sorts of other things. So I'm trying to encompass these theories into 
greater part of zoology as well. So the importance of a, an animal's place in society. Now for reptile keepers, that is as simple as, is this species commonly found with other, others of its type? And what are, what are the reports of these sex ratios between the others of its type? Well, if they are a communal species, it would be better to keep them in community. If they are a species that are well known to be aggressive to each other, you know, some of the um, Asian tree agamids, that, you know, like the forest dragon, the full chameleon thing, I forget the Latin name now. Oh. I'm terrible with Latin names. Anyway, the, the, that, that, um, that agama, <laughs> they, will, they will literally rip each other apart if you put them together in a cage. You know, they look really, really nice. And you think, oh, I'd love to get a pair of them. Don't do it. You're, you're going to end up with one and a lot of blood and guts. <laughs> That's the way they are. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so there are, there are certain animals, you know, um, I've, I've been working with Colotes bacchae, the blue-headed tree dragon. Um, we hardly know anything about them. They've only recently been described. You put two males together and you will see carnage. So, so don't do it. You know, so the importance of social structure you know, leopard geckos, we know that you can keep a male and a group of two or three females together if your enclosure is big enough and you're up to date with your welfare. That's absolutely fine. Put two males together and you've got a completely different story. So, so let's, let's use the social structure within these layers of enrichment. If an animal is solitary in the wild, you will stress it out and affect its nutritional cycles by introducing a competitor into its enclosure. If your animal is social by nature and work together like some do as teams to um, supply for their little groups, I would even include to an extent, and, and people might be shocked, but I'd even include the Tokay gecko into that. You know, pair, bonded pairs of Tokay geckos I have seen feeding young and looking after them rather than wow. predating them. Um, not just once, but lots of times. Um, you know, if they are designed or, or developed to live in community, then we should give them that, that right. And that will enable them to feel more comfortable in their position in society, in their job of work, as they're going around eating and, and drinking and making, making use of, of light and, and all of the other parameters. So, so, the, so social is actually a hard one for us as reptile keepers to keep in mind, but it's really important. Right. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. It's something that we don't often think about. No, no. If you have done it like I have and, you know, with a species that's hardly been kept before and you think, well, I wonder how we breed this. Let's have a group. And then you, you've, you've got a mad box of vicious nastiness to sort out. <laughs> yeah. You suddenly realize the importance of social order. Yeah. Now all of a sudden you need five more enclosures. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. So then I had the uh, stimulation of the senses again, and this kind of goes back into um, mental enrichment and, and, and uh, physical enrichment as well. We really start, we, we really need to start to be thinking about the wild habitats of the animals that we live in and the plants or terrain that surround them. Why? because they are sentient animals and they do have senses and they have developed to use certain types of plants per species or certain types of habi habitat. And again, we're, what we're trying to do here is reduce stresses. We're trying to allow them to find and make use of food and light in the most natural way possible for each species and their own body shape. But we're trying to um, reduce stresses and if we can reduce stresses we reduce cortisol exposure and life goes on right. really so 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 the stimulation of the um of the senses does actually become important what's the kind of shape of the branches or the bushes that, that a parson's chameleon is generally found in because that's the shape that it has developed to walk in yeah Therefore, we increase the stimulation of the mind because we're allowing it to walk in a natural way and that helps the stimulation of the body, which we'll get to next. So stimulating the animal, even as we were talking about 
um, reptiles being pollinators or some reptiles being pollinators, allowing those little geckos to dive in and out of a, a flowering stem would stimulate the brain. They are ingesting a source of nutrition. They're finding a place to hide. They feel they're safe and secure. They're, exp they're experiencing light in different colours and in different ways as, as it pushes through the plants and on and on. You know, this is stimulating for that animal. And they're Therefore, programmed to do that. Like that's part of their the behavior. We, we can't override that. You know, it doesn't matter how long they've been captured bred for, they will still behave like wild animals. Um, yeah. So so I really do see an importance in actually thinking, well, do you know what? I, I'm keeping rough green snakes. I'm not, but I'm hyper, hyper what's the name in there? Um, so, so where are they generally found? And actually is a, a, a 12 by 12 by 18 viv with a few plastic plants hanging down in there, an adequate enclosure for an animal that's actually a really highly developed spider and caterpillar keeper that is generally found in long grasses or, or sort of thicket type shrubs in full blazing sunshine for most of the year. Um, you know, stimulating through being... Um, accepting of their senses what what they've been designed to use how they've been designed to move um so i do believe that that's really important yeah no that that that's a really good point it's it's hard because we don't have the same array of senses as them we we can't assume i always try to relate it back to humans like imagine you were stuck in an environment where there were just no sense where everything had no smell that's a huge part of who we are and how we investigate an environment that you would miss out on so we need to just, nature is the easiest way to replicate it. You just look at what they have and try your best to replicate it. And then all of a sudden these behaviors will start to, to pop out. Exactly. And, and of course, each one of them allows us to see and see us, allows us to see uh, a different set of behavioral traits mm -hmm. in, in the animals. Exactly. You know? and, and, and for more experienced keepers, that's what, well, that's what excites me. How, what can I do in captivity to be able to see that animal behave in the way that I saw it when I saw it in the wild yeah. rather than just sit in a box doing nothing. Yeah. And, and that's the, really the, the point there. Like, I think the, the keepers that have their tub and their, 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 you know, newspaper and their water dish, like you said, they're resistant to the idea of adding enrichment, almost as if it's a punishment, like, Hey, you should be really adding light. You should be adding enrichment, but really you want to flip that on its head and say, like you said, you get the privilege of seeing these behaviors, of, of which is really deep down, which I assume most people want to see. It's not a punishment. It's not a punishment to add these enrichments. It's it's a privilege, and, and then you're rewarded by it. Yeah. You know, would you, any of us, if we were able to keep sidewinders, for example, who would ever want to keep that on paper where you could never see it sidewind through sand? Yeah. Exactly. Can you feel what I mean? And that animal wouldn't be able to move in the way that it is developed over unimaginable time to move. And how well would that affect the shape and the position of its organs and the, how it actually functions as it moves around on this alien surface? For Muscle example. tone, everything. Muscle tone, organ position, organ function, mm -hmm. on and on and on. Then, oh, well, what's it doing to the sense? How's it being stimulated in the senses? How's this working in its social life and its position in the, in the environment, its job of work? What's going to happen? It's going to stress out. Yeah, exactly. That's what's going to happen. And whether you start to see a, 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 sh a, a biological shock in that animal quickly or over a long period of time, that cortisol is there and it's doing a bad job. Yeah, it is eating away at them slowly. Exactly, literally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the the, the final layer um, is is physical, and okay, that's that's the part of the the, the the core three parameters. But again, just to try and and uh, keep in mind that physical movement, physical stimulation, building enclosures that allow your animal to move in a natural way, builds its physical health. If we can improve muscle tone, if we can increase blood flow, if we can jiggle about internal organs so that they don't become fat encrusted constantly, if we can inspire that animal to move, that chameleon to 
charge around its enclosure while it's hunting soldier flies. You are increasing health because the animal is moving. And if the animal is moving, its functionality goes up. The liver, the kidneys, the heart, the brain, they're all more stimulated. They're all leading to a greater level of fitness, physical fitness. So our enclosure design needs to incorporate, as we try to enrich our animals, a, a method where the animal can move naturally and is inspired to do so. If you have a um, smaller garments, like I, I have the little desert dragons uh, at work there, um, you know, we, we've created a, a prime rock stack and then other little rock stacks and plants and little bits of scrub because they're designed to jump around and catch flies out of the air and dart under this rock and skate under that rock and dig a hole and then bask. You know, we, I'm actively encourage them to leg it about. And, and in doing so, one would hope that their blood chemistry has a better chance of being uh, finding normality, that they are experiencing less in the way of stresses. So their immune system and their gut culture is even more um, potent than, than an animal that is under, uh, ill provided for. You know, we, we just need to think, how is this animal adapted to live? Can I replicate that? And how can I get them to, to do so in the first place? Now, this then comes all the way back to the first parameter of overall nutrition, where we talk, for reptiles at least, where we talk about the energy that surrounds. A reptile can only display the level of energy that surrounds it. If we under provide or provide a source of energy that is unbalanced towards sunlight, they will not have the energy to use the enclosure that you have built. Hence, unfortunately, so many bearded dragons that... I mean, I've seen pictures of bearded dragons that can't put all four feet on the floor at the same time. They're so fat. <laughs> yeah. Now, that is, that is so unlike a wild bearded dragon that that may animals... It could have come from the moon. Yeah. It, it, it is not a bearded dragon any longer. It has been overfed to a point of chronic obesity it will carry on eating they, reptiles don't have a shut off they are opportunistic feeders they never they are pre-programmed to know and to work in a situation where they never know where the next feed's coming from so you always take it whether you're full or not always so you end up with fat animals that also have uh, heating and lighting systems that are either underpowered or unbalanced they don't have the energy to move. So they're never, ever going to start burning off those fats. They're never, ever going to start jiggling their kidneys up and down and you know, putting some pressure on the bloodstream and, and, and all the things that they need to do to, to stay healthy. And you end, then you end up with fatty liver disease and fat-encrusted hearts and animals expiring. Uh, I've seen it in a lot of species. How many overfed pictures of overfed snakes do we oh see? Oh, my people? gosh, it's a plague. And I mean, they look like sausages. Yeah, they totally look like sausages. And, and a lot of times they've grown way too fast. You have an animal that should take, you know, five or six years to get to full growth. And it's like two years later, you have a full grown, like 15 foot reticulated python or something. And it becomes an aggressive negative feedback loop. Like you're saying, they, they eat more, they move less, they have less energy to use and they expand into these balloons. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I couldn't agree more. So it, you know, I've upset a few people in the past because I've published it a few times. You know, if your bearded dragon is not trying to bite you and run away, then it's not it's not being a bearded dragon. And, you know, I understand the need for a pet and this human-animal bond and everything. There comes a point where you have to say, well, that animal is now so unhealthy that there can't be a human-animal bond because now this is uh, abuse, really. We're, 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 we're killing with kindness to, to a degree. So, so we, we need to start. Goodness me, could you imagine keeping a bearded dragon in a viv that was 15 feet long and five foot high and four foot deep and having that with a nice naturalistic substrate and a rock stack and a bit of a fence and a fence post and really lighting it up well and actually seeing that bearded dragon 
look like the ones that we see on the videos. Yeah. To me, that's like, that's apex. I would keep a bearded dragon there. Yeah, exactly. You know, because it is actually being a bearded dragon. You can see that thick, live, muscular, snarling beast that just wants to leg it as fast as it possibly can yeah. and survive. You know, for me, that, that's the inspiring thing. Yeah, it totally. And, and I, also, I, I do see the need of a pet as well. You know, I think there's balance to be had in that. Exactly. And what, what I was going to say, in terms of interacting with them, there are other ways to interact with them. Like people can start target training. Bearded dragons are a great animal to start target training with. And there are different ways that as a keeper, you can interact with your animal that doesn't treat them like a cat. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and you know, that, that, that's just a fact the, the, uh, I love what you just said there. You know, anybody can target train a bearded dragon. Exactly. Well, saying that five years ago would have got you beaten up. <laughs> yeah. You know, because people, well, well, they're only reptiles. They don't know what's going on. We can just breed them. We can keep them. You know, and, and we've been saying for such a long, anybody that's, you know, looked into the eyes of a reptile and, and actually tried to understand the way that animal ticks, you know that they're sentient. Well, if you know that they're sentient and they can find food and defend a territory, they more than have enough brain capacity to be target trained. Totally. Once we start showing that these animals can be target trained and that they can follow in patterns and that they do understand social cues, it kind of opens our mind to the fact that these five providers within the three parameters of overall nutrition actually do bloody mean something. These are not thick. I hate the term. The zoological term for reptiles is lower vertebrae. Okay, they might be. But using that descriptive term now alludes to the fact to, to a situation where that animal is of less importance than a tiger or an elephant or something else I couldn't care about. Yeah, yeah. You know, they, they are not. They, these are absolutely, incredibly highly developed species. And they will mesmerize you with their intelligence. Calling them lower anything does them a huge disservice. Yeah. yeah you'd- I get really hit up about that. I can't help it. it really, I really think you, we need to do better for them. We can now with technology do better for them. Let's do it right. And let's just move away from that. Well, yeah, you can keep it in a box. It's only a snake. Mm, really? How long has that been on the earth compared to you? It's not just a snake. That is an apex predator. And if it was bigger and had hands and could talk, you wouldn't be. <laughs> you know what I mean? Totally. Yeah, exactly. And 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 the, the whole tub thing is an interesting one because it's, like I was saying, it's a negative feedback, almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy because they kept in those environments, the snake doesn't move and it supports the fact of keep it, continuing to keep it in that environment. It's like, well, the, I put it in here, it doesn't move around, so why would I do anything else? And in, in terms of looking at your reptile and optically being able to tell health, it can be challenging because reptiles do tend to hide their illness and their, their weakness very well. And do yeah, you think yeah. movement is one of the best ways to, to analyze your reptile's health? Is it you know, there's difference between stressful moving and, and appropriate moving. But if you have a ball python in a tub that sits there 99% of the time, it would be fair oh. to say that, that there is something unhealthy going on there. Yeah, because it's not moving. Exactly, yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's, not, it's not doing something. If, if you have a ball python, we call royal pythons, if you have a ball python and you put that ball python, royal python in a four by three by two and give it something to climb on, you will very quickly see that those snakes are not sedentary at all. They move and they move a lot. I know I, I do it. I've, you know, I've got one that's 12 years old and has lived in that way its whole life. And it, it's, yeah, it will have the odd day where it will sit down and not move a lot, but they will move and they will move a lot. I, I think that we can, just like you can look at a dog and see how a dog walks, you know, if it's got a dodgy knee, you know, that there's certain aspects of seeing an animal and how it's moving. Um, with comedians, we can use colour again, you know. Um, for sure, we still, we, we, we just don't know enough. We need to learn this. Yes, there are indicators in the way the animal moves, but certainly giving that animal space to move in the first place is far more important. And also lifespan seem to be a, 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 an indicator as well, which is kind of an obvious one. But at the same time, the, the idea of how long these 
sort of the common reptile in the reptile trade, how long they can live for is slowly extending, extending, extending. We're realizing proper care. Some of these an animals live for 20, 25, 30 years. And, you know, in care sheets say eight or six. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's because how typically they, how long they typically lived before nutritional imbalance finished them off. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You know, but yeah, I mean, we, we, we're going to, we're going to have, I mean, even dogs live longer than they lived when I was a child. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's, that's just because we understand dog diets better than we used All to. All of a sudden corn is not the best diet for a dog. <laughs> no, and everybody's going to roar and doing whatever they're doing, but the dogs will live longer. Of course they will. And, 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 and we will see that, you know, we, we don't actually know, and I don't think we will know for a long time how long some of these species can live. When we place them in this herpetological nirvana, this paradise of perfected energy provision and perfect recreated weather and not having any stresses around us and no risk of predation and, you know, this kind of wonderful environment that we can create for our animals should lead them to leave stress-filled active fulfilled lives for much longer than they would live in a while yeah um, and until we've been through it for another few decades we, we won't know how long they actually potentially could live for because we're removing the biggest killers the biggest killers of all life forms predation accident stress mm -hmm genetics yeah yeah and exactly we can i mean that's that's a critique that i always get people will come on and say hey you know you, you want to replicate nature but what are you going to throw like a predator in there and it's, well no we're, we're going to replicate nature as much as we can and remove the threats yeah, yeah, from the yeah. environment all right yeah i mean i, I always I, people like to say that to me because they know it presses my buttons all i say now is well I, I, yeah i'm happy to introduce a predator into my vivarium if you're happy for me to bring a tiger around once a year and just let it in the bathroom with you for half an hour <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah you know let, we're all animals yeah. let's uh, let, let's just be fair if it's okay for you to be under stress uh, if it works well, okay for the reptiles to be under threat of predation then you need to be under threat of predation as well because it must be really good for you as it is for them <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah no I, nobody ever. it's a goofy point it's a goofy point and you know the, the the biggest key is the what you when you watch the animals how amazing it is to learn from them like one of the things that i've learned in the last year with my day gecko is that she hunts in the morning before the sun comes up she she loves to hunt at like five in the morning when it's still dark and as a day gecko it's pretty shocking but i think it goes back to you know when when they're going to be safest to move in their environments and and the rest of the day she'll spend basking and, and relaxing or, or hiding and whatnot and you you wouldn't know any of that unless that madagascar rainforest was provided for her Mm. And of course, there's really good biological reasons why she does that. You know, I mean, we could talk for three hours on this, Dylan. So, so we'll we'll just cut it off uh, yeah. quickly. But there are really good reasons why she feeds early in the morning. Just to paraphrase, the insects are cooler than they are in the day, so they're moving more slowly, or more slowly than she is. They've just been through all their nutritional cycles themselves, so their guts are fully primed, and they've been through, dare I say, the D three cycle because they've been out side in in exposure to uv and we now know that insects go through the same d3 cycle that vertebrates do as well well for quite a few species they are nutritionally sound moving slowly and she's at a position of the day where the risk of predation is lower than it would be in the middle of the day it is better for her to eat early and late and safer see how these five layers of environmental provision or enrichment power they're all answered you we cover them all just in statements like well i've noticed my gecko eats at five in the morning well why well it's because that's what they do it's the best time well let's drill down further why is that the best time well it might be safer well why is it safer and and on and it on and unfolds on. forever which is just so, so amazing so i i think anytime i talk to you my mind is blown and it makes me go back to the the drawing board and, and want to redesign things i know the listeners feel the same way is there anything else that you wanted to add before i let you go well yeah i mean there's plenty still to talk about i i, I wrote a a paragraph i just wanted to read out sure. before we go absolutely that, that, was, that was in this uh, document that, that I've just written. Because I think, you know, as reptile keepers, we now, we, we should be thinking 
about the three parameters. We should be thinking about the five um, features of uh, enrichment. We should be thinking about our heating and lighting. Overall, we should be thinking about our vivarium. Okay, this is the important thing. Does the enclosure that I'm thinking of buying, can it possibly cater for the needs of the animal that I want to keep? Okay, the, in, the vivarium is the one piece of technology that you'll buy that dictates how you use all of your other technology. If you buy the wrong viv, the wrong size, type, um, layout, you will always struggle to keep the animal in the way that you might wish to. So I just wrote, I, I wrote this little short, very short paragraph here, which, which I kind of hope will help. And I just put, the vivarium itself is as vital to the correct provision of an animal as is the provision of the pertinent heating and lighting systems. These are not just boxes in which an animal is living, but rather they are a core part of the technology needed to ensure high levels of health and well-being. Therefore, choosing the right type and size of vivarium then installing the correct decoration or naturalistic habitat alongside the correct electronics is as of vital importance to overall health and well-being as every other part of the system. So we really need to stop thinking that vivariums are just boxes that we keep our animals in and a, a bearded dragon needs a 4 by 2 by 2 Actually, why? And can you possibly provide for its needs in that? You know, your vivarium is as important as your UV lamp, which is as important as your water bowl. Yes, yeah. And on and on. So often people start with the their viv, they don't think about it. They start with it and they go, okay, how am I going to design, design this viv for my animal? But really you need to go one step back and really analyze what are you trying to replicate and what viv is going to do that best for you? What size is it going to be tall, wide, whatever it is? There are so many questions you need to ask. You can't just start with, with the, the glass box and go from there. No, you know, I'm a real big fan of glass vivs, mesh top glass vivs. I've, for me, and particularly living in the UK and in the, enviro, in, the, in the animal room that I've got, they work really well. But I have wooden vivs as well. Um, each has its own use and each is better for certain different species. Um, the most important thing we can all do is make sure that our animals are free from stress. That will show one of the, other than getting the heating, lighting and feeding right, removing stresses will have the biggest positive impact on our animals as possible. So for everybody that uses screen or glass vivariums, cover as many sides as you possibly can or that animal will always feel insecure. There's a, a chance about bioactive systems very frequently. And I, I like to watch the videos and the, the Viv builds uh, and the animals being introduced. And every single time I think, why are you not covering the back and sides? Why are you just putting a substrate and some sticks and a, and a plant in? That you're not reducing stresses for that animal. It can it's still exposed on five sides. You know, you could make what is a pretty good enclosure and a skillful design of plant placement or whatever. You could make that so much better just by covering the sides and back of that enclosure. That will dramatically reduce the stresses that that animal's subject to cortisol down <laughs> yeah yeah and it takes so long for reptiles sometimes to even adapt to a new environment so if you pluck it into an environment that looks like you know eyes could be looking at it from all sides it's going to be stressed out perpetually they, well they're going to be go they're going to be stressed out and they're not going to behave normally because they think they're going to be eaten well what's going on where am i what's around what hawk is it a dog is it you know they, <laughs> every shadow that goes that by thing. yeah exactly but by kind of encasing them a bit the back and both sides at least, sometimes even the, the bottom section of the glass, if it's not fully filled with substrate, we, you know, we should put wood along there as well so they're not constantly looking out at floor level. Right. All lower stresses. You know, again, you know, we, talk, we talked about Asian agamids earlier. They, 
I could quite easily lump Asian tree dragons, all the Acanthosaurus species and Dracos and everything together and say, they're one species that I've kept for 30 years on and off that always show stress very soon after coming into the house. Well, some of those species will expire overnight if they're overstressed, you know, particularly flying lizards, you know, Draco or the Draco species, they really, really suffer with stress. And it's that cortisol spike that affects the immune, the um, gut flora, which affects the immune system, which allows parasites to go up and then the animal dies. It's not eating, it's not drinking, it's all out of balance. Well, Let's take that one step further. We cover the sides and the back. Well, but for the first six weeks after they've arrived, and they're pretty much all wild caught still, let's cover the front as well. Let's give this animal the respect that it's due to be able to settle down from moving from Vietnam to Canada. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Wherever they've arrived from. Um, and, and, you know, I've seen that, that theory work out time and time again. Animals that you'd expect a high percentage of to die if you put them in in seclusion for the first six weeks, many less die than usually do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's not an argument for seclusion forever. <laughs> like when you might get a new a new animal no, throw it in a tub that has no light. It's like that's great for first six weeks quarantine. Get them going. Get them healthy. Yeah, it's not a perpetual well, thing. Well, what we're doing is we're using its social hierarchy and its social structure and all of the five layers of enrichment to see why that animal particularly suffers with stress and then building around it because it's stress that kills it. Exactly. Awesome. No, I think that's a great way to finish off. I think that uh, is a a great paragraph. And when when that gets out, I know that in the next couple months, I'm sure that'll be published somewhere for people to read. Yeah, 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 it will. Well, yeah, for sure. Can you point people to where they can find you, your work, everything online? Yeah, of course, You there's the Arcadia Reptile website, Arcadia Bird website. There, You can't buy a product from us. We're not there to sell you a product at all. These are educational resources. So the lighting guides, are in, uh, the interactive lighting guides there, the feeding guides there, um, all of the podcasts I've ever recorded. There's free access through a, a podcast bank on there. You can read about my books um and, and of course all the product that we make and how it works and why it works and videos for each it's quite an interactive that's uh, arcadia reptile.com we have facebook instagram youtube all, all of the usual uh, social media streams and we post every day yeah yeah and the, the the instagram feed is great there's always awesome pictures and, and it, the website is amazing if you need information on lighting and it, just go to the website it, it lays out very easily you can type in the species and it will give you a good guide do you have any yeah. ideas for, for books in the future? Do you have anything that you're working on? Um, no. <laughs> I, I, know what I'm, I, I know what I am going to write about um, in the next book. I, I, I'm not starting. All the time that I'm thinking about visible light still and, and all of this stuff, it's not the right time to start writing again. Um, tentatively, I've written a manuscript for a bird book, um, bird keeping. Um, that might see the light of day. We'll, we'll see. Um, I, I can't promise anything. Yeah. Well, either way you have these, uh, four amazing books out now and I always point people to them and, and yeah. it's, uh, amazing resources. The amount of times I've heard people say those books have changed their people's philosophy and psychology <laughs> and reptile keeping is just like every time I hear it, it's just, it's, it's amazing. So I point everybody there and uh, well, thank you. Thank you very much for joining me. This is, we went way over time. Hopefully the, <laughs> hopefully you had some time to burn after this because it was a fantastic conversation. I know this will get people's blood flowing and, and their brains going. So thank you very much. Well, I hope so. I hope so. Th- thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure to, to be able to help and just chat. I, I love that. It's great. All right. That brings us to the end of that episode. John, thank you so much for joining me. That was a fantastic conversation. I know that's going to get my brain and everyone else's brain, their gears turning to make improvements. And actually, I already have. If you have followed me on YouTube, I have made an upgrade to my jungle carpet python enclosure. So if you're not subscribed to me on YouTube, you can just search animals at home and you can find that there. I did change the lighting and added some more ventilation to my jungle carpet python enclosure. Every time I speak to John, it sparks my mind to go do and make some improvements. And I really hope that's what you do as well. 
So if you are looking for more information on John or Arcadia Reptile, go to animalsathomenetwork.com. You can find the show notes there. All the links will be in there. I highly recommend picking up John's books. They are such a great resource to have in your reptile room. When you first get the books, obviously you read them cover to cover because it's fascinating to read. But what I do is once I've finished the books, they just sit on my bookshelf in my reptile room and I use them as a reference. Whenever I have a question about nutrition or heating or lighting or humidity, I can just reference one of the three books that I have and I'll find the answer shortly. And again, I think it's really important to make the note that it's not about jumping from one level of care to the highest level of care possible in one fell swoop. Nobody can. Most people don't have disposable income to go spend, you know, a thousand dollars on resetting up an enclosure. The goal with conversations like this is to spark you to want to improve, to slowly progress towards more natural replication. Of course, it's tempting to just run out and to spend thousands of dollars and upgrade all the enclosures and try to replicate nature as best you can. But you also have to think about yourself. You have to think about your family and your bills, and and you can't just be irresponsible with your money. So that's why it is more important to have the mindset of growth, the mindset of progressing towards more natural replication. The process of replicating nature really is a never-ending process. You never get to that finish line. You're constantly tinkering as technology improves, as information improves, as with the science of uh, our understanding of how the animals interact with their imp- environment improves. You're constantly going to be working towards something better. And that's the mindset you want. You don't want to be static with your care. You want to constantly be, constantly be evolving. Sometimes that's going to you know, involve going to invest in a piece of equipment that's expensive. But sometimes that's going to be just a, you know, adding some enrichment, maybe going to the, the greenhouse and buying some plants, which I'm actually planning on doing today. Small improvements like that, some will cost money, some don't have to cost money at all. But again, it's that mindset, the mindset, the philosophy of care that has a foundation in progression. That is it. That's what makes owning reptiles exciting. It's a never-ending process, and every time you make an improvement, you will be rewarded for it. I can promise you that. You know, I've said it before that there is something at least a little bit selfish about keeping an animal in your home. And if you can't accept that, then you really need to think about why you're keeping the animal. So if you accept the fact that partly it is a selfish need, you're fulfilling a desire to keep something and to have nature in your home, then we owe it to the animal to do our best all the time. And again, that doesn't mean 10 out of 10 care. That means progression. As simple as that. Well, I really hope you enjoyed that episode. Please share this one. This is one of those episodes that really can be a mindset shifter for many people. So share this one far and wide. I would really appreciate that. And if you are interested in learning more about Animals at Home, you can head to animalsathomenetwork.com. Thank you to our sponsor, customreptilehabitats.com. Again, affiliate links are in the show notes as well as the YouTube description. If you do end up purchasing something, a small commission does come back to me at no extra cost to you that helps support the show. And I will talk to you guys in two weeks.